How y'all doing today? The Bible says Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. <clears throat> Our lesson today is going to be repentance. Who and why? All right, so let's go to the Father and ask for a word of wisdom. Heavenly Father, most high God, we come to you this afternoon, Lord. We do humble our hearts. We do ask you to forgive our many transgressions, Lord, and we ask you to help us not be transgressors of you, or of your word, or of your people. Father, we thank you for all the bountiful blessings that you give us. Thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for letting us come together to study your word. Lord, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to anoint my lips to speak and to anoint our eyes and ears to see and hear the things you need us to get from your word, things that we need to understand and give us the strength then to do those things that we see we must do and accomplish your will. We thank you for all these things in the name, above all names, your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. I'm going to warn you now, if you're looking for a feel-good message, something to make you happy, this is not going to be the one. <clears throat> I do hope it realize, makes us realize how badly we need to repent, we and our fathers. Don't think I'm preaching at y'all and not to me, because I probably need this worse than anybody. I'm as guilty as anybody and probably more so, because a lot of what I'm going to tell you today I've known most of my life and have failed to do. Failed miserably. Now we learned in the first few messages in this series on repentance that repentance is to change one's mind for better. <clears throat> or hardly to amend with abhorrence of past sins. You should hate your past sins once you have repented. Now, what is sin? Let's look at the definition. 1 John 3, 4 gives us the definition of sin. It says, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. So sin is lawlessness or violating the law. What law are we talking about? What law was John talking about? <clears throat> that would be the law of God. Now, let me ask you this. Who is under God's law? Who is obligated to obey the law and the word of God? Let's read Psalm 147, 19. Psalms 147, 19 and 20. It says in the psalm that he declares his words to Jacob, his statutes and his ordinances to Israel. Verse 20. He has not dealt thus with any nation. And for his ordinances, they, that would be the other nations, they have not known them. Praise the Lord. Let's look at Deuteronomy 4, 7, and 8. Deuteronomy 4. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 4, 7 says, For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God whenever we call upon Him? Verse 8. Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I'm setting before you today? Now, we just read two witnesses from your Bible that only... Jacob, the house of Israel, had the law of God. Nobody else. He said nobody else has known this law. That would necessarily mean that only the house of Israel could be under the law and only the house of Israel could be guilty of breaking the law. We confirm that from the New Testament. Romans 5. Let's look at Romans 5, uh, verse 12 and 13. Romans chapter 5. Therefore, 
just as through one man sin entered into the world. And death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. Now what men is he talking about? 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So, people may be sinning, but the sin is not imputed to them if they do not have the law because they're not under it. And we just read Israel was the only one under the law, so Israel was the only one that had sin imputed to them. Therefore, nobody else could be guilty. Uh, and if you read your scripture, that's why you never read God talking about, he talked about how bad the Canaanites and everybody else were. But he didn't talk about them near as bad as he did Israel because they weren't under that law. That was not the law given to them. Paul said all sin was in the world, but it was not imputed. We saw it only belonged to Israel. The law belonged to Israel, therefore the sin belonged to Israel. That means only Israel has to repent. Does that make sense? Well, what and why do we need to repent? What do we need to repent of? We've seen how most of what happens in the kingdom of Israel is connected to the leadership of our kings, or in fact, the lack thereof. How did it get to be this way? Israel started out with a perfect king because God Almighty himself was their king. For whatever foolish reason, they chose to abandon this perfect setup and adopt a different form of government. In reality, this was the same sin that happened in the garden. The one that led to the fall of Adam and his removal from the kingdom. Remember what the serpent told Eve as we read that story in Genesis? She said, you, he told Eve that, no, no, you, you won't die if you partake of the fruit. What will happen is you'll be as God discerning good and evil. Or in other words, you'll have the authority of God to be able to determine right and wrong for yourself. Is that not we, what we're looking for today? Self-government, self-determination? What does your constitution say? We the people in order to establish a more perfect union. I got news for you. The people can't establish a perfect union. They can't establish any kind of union. God has established the government. So, not only that, all of Adam's descendants have inherited that same rebellious nature. Later on, the descendants in the kingdom of Israel managed to display that arrogant, rebellious nature in a most detrimental way. They asked for a king. They said, we don't want God. We want a man. Well, and it, even as it is today, we try to blame a lot of people for our current situation today. We can actually put the blame all the way back there, but you know, we can find any number of excuses for our disobedience. We can say, oh, it's the government. It's the liberals. You know, it's, uh, oh, it's the conservatives. It's the foreigners. It's the Jews. It's the Edomites. It's the descendants of Cain. It might be the Masons or the Catholics or bad Bible translations. Lord knows it might even be Satan the devil that causes our bad behavior. We can come up with all kinds of scapegoats for what we do wrong. But remember the story of the first sin in the garden? How did that turn out? Adam blamed Eve and Eve blamed the snake. Everybody wants to pass the buck. Truth be known, who does God blame for all these problems? God's Word is the final authority on this subject. And God Almighty says the problem is the children of Israel. Let's read Isaiah. Let's read Isaiah, what he said about it. Isaiah, starting chapter 1, verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, concerning Judah and Jerusalem, which he saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Verse 2, listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. Now, listen carefully. I'm going to emphasize these words here. <clears throat> for the Lord speaks, sons have I reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. 
An ox knows its owner and a donkey its master's manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Verse 4. Alas, sinful nation. People weighed down with iniquity. Offspring of evildoers. Sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from Him. Verse 5. Where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is nothing sound in it, only bruises and welts and raw wounds not pressed out or bandaged or softened with oil. Verse 7, Your land is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your fields, strangers are devouring them in your presence. It is desolation as overthrown by strangers. You think? <clears throat> Verse 8, The daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a watchman's hut in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. Verse 9, unless the Lord, had ho Lord of hosts had left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom, we would be like Gomorrah. Now, about 20 times in those nine verses right there, God pointed the finger directly at who? Israel. His people. His rebellious sons. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? That's what he compared them to. Does that not sound like Isaiah ought to be speaking to us today? Can we see a bunch of that Sodom and Gomorrah stuff going on in the world? Everywhere? Who did Isaiah say was to blame? Did he say it was the devil? <laughs> yeah. The devilish children of Israel. Offspring of evildoers. God said there are children who are weighed down with iniquity. They have turned away from their God. And what's the result of their rebellion? He said your cities are burned with fire and your strangers are devouring them in your presence. Huh. Maybe it's sanctuary cities. Maybe it's BLM and Antifa. Have y'all been seeing any news about stuff like that? It's been happening for several years now. Um... You know, all the cities in our Israelite nations around the world, not just in America, all the Israelite nations, they're either being burned, destroyed, or overthrown continually, taken over by strangers. Isaiah also said, your land is desolate. Have y'all heard people talking about food shortages? What about the foreigners and all the billionaires that are supposedly buying up all of our farmland, all of our food production facilities? Why is all this happening? Is it because our enemies are so smart and so powerful and so rich? No. What did Isaiah say? Isaiah said, Israel does not know. He said, my people do not understand. He said, they are a sinful nation. They are weighed down with iniquity. They are offspring of evildoers. They act corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. And they have turned away from Him. Did God mention any of the enemies here that, that we normally think about? No. Unless you agree with old comic Pogo where he said, when he said, uh, we have met the enemy and he is us. If you go along with that, then you see who God's enemies are. It's the Israelites. Our outside enemies, all those people we want to blame for everything, they can't make us do anything. They have no power or no authority to make us do one single thing. <clears throat> not when we live in obedience to God. Uh, we'll read what James said about that, but, but I first want to, I want to clarify who the book of James is written to because there seems to be a lot of confusion, uh, especially in some of the seminaries and all, but let's read the book and see what it says. I want to confirm because he was, he's talking to the same people that Isaiah talked to. James chapter 1, verse 1 says James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve 
tribes of Israel who are dispersed abroad. Greetings. Now I've heard that all the seminaries say that that 12 tribes there means some kind of a so-called Gentile church. Now in the Greek New Testament, that word church is translated from Strong's word G1577, which is ecclesia or ecclesia. The word means a calling out, a popular meeting, especially a religious congregation, a community of members on the earth, or saints in heaven, or both, an assembly or a church. The King James Bible translated that word 118 times. In 115, it used the word church, and three times it used the word assembly. Now, despite it being used 115 times or 118 times in the Scripture, somehow, so-called Bible scholars would have you believe, and I believe, that the Holy Spirit or James or both of them were somehow confused and they couldn't tell the difference between some kind of a Gentile church and the 12 tribes or the house of Israel. And so therefore they say, well, they just didn't put the word Ecclesia there. They just accidentally used the 12 tribes of Israel. No, there's no accident. There's no mistranslation. The text simply means exactly what it says. It says James was writing to the house of Israel and he knew and understood that the house of Israel was not only still in existence, but they were scattered abroad. They'd been scattered starting in 721 B.C. from the northern kingdom. And he said this to those dispersed Israelites. Let's read verse 2. Let's go on down through here to about verse 8. Verse 2, he said, Consider it all joy, my brethren, and that's a term of kinship, when you enter various trials. Verse 3, Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Verse 4, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Verse 5, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given him. Verse 6, but he must ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Verse 7. For that man ought not to expect he will receive anything from the Lord. Why? Because verse 8 says, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So we know the book of James is addressed to the twelve tribes of Israel. These are the same Israelites that Isaiah said their whole head was sick and their heart was faint. Isaiah said these Israelites were dumber than an ox and a donkey. Now if you'll turn to chapter 4 in the book of James, you'll see James didn't talk very much better about them. James 4, let's start at verse 1. James is asking a question to these 12 tribes. <clears throat> he said, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? Verse 2, you lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Verse 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Verse 4, what did James tell him? You adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Are any of us doing that? Yeah, I hope we're not. Verse 5. Or do you think the Scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the Spirit which He has made to dwell in us. Verse 6, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. <laughs> Thank God he does. Verse 7, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We've talked about that before. Even the devil, if there is some supernatural being, guess what? 
All you got to do is submit to God and He won't run away from you. you don't, he's afraid of you as long as you're in God, in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Verse 9, Be miserable and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. So basically we're looking at the same people with two different writers. And both of them are telling us that these rebellious people bring about their own calamity. All because they refuse to submit and obey their Maker. The same story is repeated all the way through the Bible about the same people. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 22. Jeremiah 4, 22. See what he said. See if Jeremiah had a better opinion of these Israelites. He says, For my people are foolish. They know me not. They are stupid children and have no understanding. They are shrewd to do evil, but to do good they do not know. That, that doesn't sound very good, folks. What did Hosea say? Hosea had some pretty good words for the children of Israel too. Hosea 4, verse 1. says, Listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel. For the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land because there's no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. Doesn't that sound about like where we are today? Nobody knows anything about God. Verse 2. There is swearing deception, murder, stealing, and adultery. They employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed. Verse 3, Therefore the land mourns, and everyone who lives in it languishes, along with the beast of the field and the birds of the sky, and also the fish of the sea disappear. Is that kind of what we see on the news every day? They tell us we're headed for Famine and food shortages. We've got bird flu supposedly coming. It's going to wipe out all our chickens and all our livestock. And cattle are causing global warming. And we're going to have to eat bugs and plants to, keep, you know, to stop global warming. Is that really the problem? Is that, is that what's going on? No. Listen to Hosea. Let's read verse 4. He said, Yet let no one find fault and none offer reproof. For your people are like those who contend with the priest. And that's what will happen. I'm not a priest, but I'm reading this right here, and I guarantee you people are going to make comments and argue. Oh, well, that's, that's the Old Testament. Oh, that's done away with. Well, you can argue with me, but you can't argue with this Scripture. Verse 5. Here's, what, here's the result. Here's what you're going to reap. Verse 5 says, So you will stumble by day, and the prophet also will stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. That's your... Feel good preachers out there. They're going to stumble with you. All of you are going to be staggering together. Verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Folks, that's just about happened. Verse 7 said, The more they multiplied, the more they sinned against me. I will change their glory into shame. Wow. About this great country we lived in used to be the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And what's happened? Our glory has been turned into shame. Verse 8 They feed on the sin of my people and direct their desire toward their iniquity. Verse 9 and it will be like people, like priests. So I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. So see, however the people are, well, the people don't want to hear the preaching. So they go down here to these churches on Main Street where they tell them, oh, Jesus loves you. No matter what you do, just feel good about yourself. Well, they're going to reap what they sow. Verse 10 says this, But they will eat, but not have enough. They will play the harlot, but not increase, because they have stopped giving heed to the Lord. Verse 11. Harlotry and wine and new wine take away the understanding. 
Verse 12, he said, My people consult with their wooden idol, and their diviner's wand informs them. For a spirit of harlotry has led them astray, and they have played the harlot, departing from their God. <clears throat> you know what Sarah said? The diviner's wand informs them. <clears throat> you know that's exactly what's going on today? Do you know what the diviner's wand is? The magician's wand? You know what they make them out of? They make the magician's wand out of the out of a branch from a holly tree. So your diviner's wand is Hollywood. How about that? Does <laughs> do you think Hollywood is directing our thoughts and it is for the majority of our people? If you ever want to read a fairly short synopsis of why Israel went into Assyrian and, and Babylonian captivity, you need to read the books of Nehemiah and Ezra, but Nehemiah is pretty good. And uh, This was at a time when the king had issued a, degree, a decree. The book of Nehemiah was written during that time. And a small remnant from Judah had returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and the walls and the temple. I want us to read a little bit out of that today. And we need to note these actions were initiated by Nehemiah who was governor over Jerusalem during the restoration. Now, who would, who would that be today? That wasn't necessarily initiated by the priest or the churches. It was initiated by the king or the governor. Uh, who would be our king or our governor today? If you said Donald Trump or Joe Biden, you're wrong. Uh, the current governor or king of Israel, if you please, if you're a Christian or actually if you live anywhere between heaven and earth, there is only one king. Not Biden, it's not Trump, it's not King Charles, it's not even Benjamin Netanyahu over there in Israel. Jesus explained this from Matthew 28, 18. Let's read what Jesus himself said. Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, did he mean what he said? He said that about 2,000 years ago. So, do you consider Jesus' words to be true? I do. Well, in this case, the people responded to the commandment of the king in the book of uh, Nehemiah, so maybe we need to look at their example and see how it worked. <clears throat> We're supposed to obey our king. Jesus asked a simple question one time and it's pertinent and relevant for today. How does he want us to respond? Remember when he asked that question in Luke 6? Let's look at Luke 6, 46. Jesus said one simple question. Why do you call me Lord, Lord and do not do what I say? See, people going around and got bumper stickers, got t-shirts, Jesus, you know, signs out in front of the church that Jesus is Lord and all that. He's in charge. Jesus is our king. But do we obey him? Do we do what our king said? I've said this several times in our message on repentance up till now. Until we know what God's word actually says, we don't even know how to repent. How can we obey the commandments that Jesus said we're supposed to obey if we don't even know what they are? We don't have an excuse not to know them today. Because anybody that has any desire at all or any gumption, if you can read, you can get a copy of this Bible. Uh, almost everybody's got a copy in their home unless they're an atheist or, or <laughs> practice a different religion. Even a lot of people who practice other religions have a copy of the Bible in their homes and they can read it anytime they want to. Nobody stops us in, in the Western Christian countries. Nobody stops us from reading the Bible. Now, in prior history, there was a time that it was almost impossible to have the Bible or to read it. Scripture in the Old Testament days, and even in the days of Jesus, the Scripture was primarily maintained in the temple by the priests and the Levites. And it was a pretty intense job because they wrote it on, on the old scrolls that were rolled up. They had to hand copy every scroll <clears throat> to preserve the sacred text, and they had to copy it pretty often because the scrolls would wear out as they rolled them in and out reading them. The skins would get old, they'd tear, the 
ink would fade and run, rub off. But uh, after that period, then the Catholic Church got a hold of it, and uh, they restricted the possession of the scriptures to the clergy. The general public was not allowed to have copies of the Bible. It wasn't until the 16th and 17th centuries after the Great Reformation opened up the Word of God to the people and printing presses uh, were invented that made it possible to produce affordable copies that it finally became public property, so to speak. Great men were persecuted and some of them died because they dared to translate God's Word from Hebrew, Greek, and Latin into German and English. Nevertheless, it was accomplished. The printing press was invented, and that's one of the first books they printed on the printing press, by the way, was the Word of God. Now it's readily available in our world today in any format you want. You can get it in print. You can get it online. You can get it an app on your phone. There's no excuse. If you want a Bible, there's almost no reason. Uh, if you have an impairment, you can actually have a, something. If you can't read, you can have it read to you on, a, on an app on a phone or a tablet or a computer. There's virtually no reason you can't get to the Word of God to study it. And we need to be thankful for that. We don't need to ever take our Bibles for granted. It is a gift from Almighty God. And it was given to us exactly as prophesied. Once we learn to read and understand it, then we can learn how to repent. I'm going to give you one example of that from the book of Nehemiah. What happens and kind of how we're going to have to do it. We're going to have to start studying this book. And then when we learn what we've got to do, we're going to have to obey it. <clears throat> Let's look at Nehemiah chapter 8, starting verse 1. It says, And all the people gathered together as one man at the square which was in front of the water gate. And they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Now, that people gathered together as one man at the square that's what they're talking about when they talk about Christian unity. The, all the people came together to hear the word of God. Verse 2. Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding. On the first day of the seventh month. Verse 3. He read from it before the square which was in front of the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and women who could understand. All the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra read the book and everybody listened. Verse 5, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. So they respected the word of God. So when your preacher says, please stand before we read the word of the Lord, that's where he gets it from. And there's a good reason for that. We need to honor the word of God. Verse 6, then Ezra, blessed, let's try that again. then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. They bowed low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Yeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Gammon, Akab, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kelida, Azariah, Jehozabad, Hanan, Peliah, the Levites, explained the law to the people while they remained in their place. Verse 8, they read from the book of the law of God, translating to give sense so that they understood the reading. Now that part of that translating... Some of their language had been done away with. They had, some of them had taken on a different language when they went into captivity in Babylon. Some of them couldn't speak in the Hebrew language anymore. Some of them spoke in the languages of other people. Uh, and they needed understanding as well. They needed to explain. So they had all these Levites who were there explaining and breaking down the Word of God. And why is this necessary? We all need somebody to explain the Word to us. Remember what Philip said, uh, when Philip was sent to the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8? Let's read that. Acts 8, 30 and 31. It says, Philip ran up behind him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. And he said, Do you understand what you're reading? Verse 31, and he said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? 
and he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. I think it went on to say that he explained Jesus to him from Isaiah. But Philip had the understanding and he was able to explain it. And that's what he did. Now here's a perfect example of what it means to repent. We know these people were here. They were learning the law. They had the law explained. And then what happened? Let's read Nehemiah 8 starting in verse 13. Then on the second day, the heads of the fathers of the households of all the people. Y'all men, listen up. This is your job. The priest and the Levites were gathered to Ezra the scribe that they might gain insight into the words of the law. This is your men's meeting. Verse 14. They found written in the law how the Lord had commanded through Moses that the sons of Israel should live in booths during the feast of the seventh month. 15. So they proclaimed and circulated a proclamation in all their cities in Jerusalem saying, Go out to the hills and bring in olive branches and wild olive branches and myrtle branches and palm branches and branches of other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. So, what did it say? They believed in Jesus with all their heart and they were saved. No, it says they believed and confessed with their mouth. Yeah. But then what happened? They immediately took their hands and did the work of obedience as it was commanded in the law. What happened after that? Verse 16. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the square at the water gate and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. Verse 17. The entire assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in them. The sons of Israel had not indeed not done so from the days of Joshua the son of Nun to that day. And there was great rejoicing. You see, understanding and obeying God's law brings rejoicing among His people. Maybe not so much for other people, the enemies of God and God's law, but His people are blessed and will be rejoicing when they obey. Why would you not want to obey if it, if it works? Verse 18, what did this lead to? He read from the book of the law of God daily from the first day to the last, and they celebrated the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the ordinance. So they learned something else from the law. They knew they had to live in booths, and they knew there was to be a solemn assembly. So we had here what you might call a great revival in the kingdom, organized by the leader, administered by the priest, and participated in by all men and women of understanding. How did it start? It says the entire group was instructed in the law. Then it says after they heard the law and were instructed, they observed the feast by dwelling in booths. They put their hands to work and it caused them to rejoice. Now next time I want to go over some more stuff from Nehemiah, but in closing today, we need to remember who has to repent and why. It's the same people all the way through Scripture even till today. The sin is also the same that it ever was. The only way we can begin to resolve the problems is to do what they did there in the book of Nehemiah. We have to come together as a nation or as a family. We have to read and study God's Word. Then we have to put our hands to work to obey that Word. Our King, our Commander-in-Chief, Jesus Christ, is currently seated at the right hand of the Father. And it says He's waiting for His enemies to be made His footstool. Scripture says He's restrained in the heavens until that time. Once that happens, He's coming here into this kingdom to take the throne of His father David and reign over the house of Israel forever. Right here where we are. Now we've got a simple choice to make. We can either continue in this Babylonian system of corruption that's destroying God, that's killing, well not killing us, well it is, it's destroying God's people and destroying His kingdom or taking the kingdom by violence, as Jesus said. We can either stay in that system or we can come out of it and watch it burn to the ground. God cannot destroy Babylon as long as we choose to stay in it. He can't do it. He, he's going to destroy us. Revelation 18.4 says what? Revelation 18.4 says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people 
so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. Are you ready to see Babylon receive plagues? Get out of it. So, here's the bad news and the good news. The bad news is, the time's coming she's going to be destroyed and no matter who's in it, it's going to be destroyed. If you're still there, you got a problem. The good news is, you can choose to come out at any time and God will help you do it. I hope you make the right choice. I hope you choose to get out and leave Babylon. Now, next time I want to go a little bit further in Nehemiah and see what it means, kind of what they did when they came out of Babylon in the old days. Maybe we can learn how to come, up, come out of Babylon once again. Amen? All right. Appreciate y'all listening to me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for being able to come together and study your word. Lord, we pray that you give us strength and wisdom and your spirit to see and understand your word and give us the power and ability to perform the works that we need to do to bring about your kingdom. We thank you for all these things and we praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.